Welcome to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by Coastal Alabama Community College. Our show focuses on workplace and workforce trends. Always looking for new ideas and new people to meet that'll give us some insights into how to make our workplace or our workforce a little bit better, do things a little bit differently. Today, we're going to take the show down somewhat of a different path, not in regards to workplace or workforce, but into ideas. Have you ever had a product idea? Have you ever had an invention in mind that you'd kind of even conceived how to get it going? Have you ever wanted to start a business? All these things, I think, which are part of anybody's imagination is, I think, it, wouldn't it be great if we had something that did this? Or, boy, I wish there was a business that did something like this. I certainly have, and I'll tell you my story real quick. Years back, I was doing some work in the financial services industry. They're a big part of uh, my work. And I asked one client if they would be interested in a series of videos uh, teaching some of the stuff that I taught to the financial services industry. And they said, yeah, that sounds pretty interesting. We'd be very interested. So I took that feedback and went to work. And it took about six to eight months. I hired a great videographer to get it all down to produce these videos. We wrote scripts. We did research. I uh, borrowed office space off of friends of mine to get perfectly professional environments in place to record these videos. And we worked for about a month, perhaps it was even more than a month, in shooting the videos. We would load in at night, shoot all throughout the night, film these videos. Now, each video was about three to four minutes long. And again, one major point that I often teach in the financial services industry would be covered in each of these videos. Once that was over, we went into editing and adding the uh, text and then adding the worksheets that accompanied the videos and then finding the online LMS, learning management system, to hold the videos and support them in the marketplace online so that people could subscribe and enter their credit card. And bottom line, we spent an extraordinary amount of time and I spent an extraordinary amount of money getting these videos in place. And when they were all in place, I went back to that very same client and said, they're there. Here they are. Go ahead. You can, you can buy them now and have all your people watch them. And their response was, well, we've moved on since then. There's something else that's now more important. So I went back to the, uh, the broader financial services marketplace in general and tried to find a market for these things. I was deep in the hole um, and got a little bit of feedback and a little bit of feedback and a little bit of feedback. The point is, these videos were beautiful, but if I had done my market research the way I should have, this would not have been an issue. What do you do? when you have an invention? What do you do when you have a business idea and you're wondering what the market feedback would be, when you're wondering what the marketplace support would be? I can tell you this, I won't do that amount of work without knowing that I have customers in place down the road, without having done my thorough amount of market research. And uh, a business, any business ideas I have going forward are all about mitigating the risk of a new business product, a new business line, or an invention to reduce the exposure. Our focus today is how to come up with a business idea, or if you have a business idea or an invention in mind, how to do the right things to bring that thing to market. And my two guests will teach us how to go about exactly doing that. They live here in Mobile. They work at the University of South Alabama, and we will meet them when we come back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. The show is brought to you by Coastal Alabama Community College. We'll be right back. Think about how people really see you. The kid at the drive-thru just sees a coffee drinker. Please pull forward. Your local barista sees the person who loves a smiley face in their latte. See you next time. It's kind of the same way with insurance. Other insurance companies just see a customer, but a state farm agent sees more. They see you as a neighbor. Your state farm agent is here to get to know who you really are so they can help life go right. Call me, State Farm Agent Allison Horner, and Mobile at 666-1616. Hey, this is Cam Marston. If sales in your business comes from prospecting to create leads that lead to sales, I want to tell you about Sales Up Coach, 
a cloud-based system created for the next generation of sales professional. There's a big difference between being busy and being effective. And Sales Up Coach helps salespeople who rely on prospecting uncover which of their activities produce the greatest results. Over time, Sales Up Coach's machine learning hones salespeople's schedule to focus only on activities that generate the most bang for the buck. Your sales team interacts with Sales Up Coach on their smartphone, and sales managers can instantly generate reports to see who is on goal and who may need additional support. Go online and take a look at this new and very powerful sales tool. Go to salesupcoach.com slash Cam Marston. Watch your sales team's productivity change. Is your business growing? Does your existing metal building need an update? Expansion? New roof? With almost 20 years of experience, Mosley Building Systems is the leading metal building contractor along the Gulf Coast. We are your local design build experts. From expansion to new construction or repairs, we can guide you through all aspects of your project. Mosley Building Systems works with each client to fulfill their vision. For more information, go to MosleyBuildingSystems.com. We're back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by Coastal Alabama Community College. My guests today, let me give you an introduction. I have Dr. Michael Chambers in front of me. Michael serves as the Associate Vice President of Research at the University of South Alabama. Before coming to South, Dr. Chambers co-founded and served as CEO of Interx. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Interx. Interx Pharmaceuticals, an ocular drug delivery company until negotiating its sale to Sermotix. Did I pronounce that correct? Yep, right. Yeah. And then founded Swift Biotech, an ovarian cancer diagnostics company. Uh, Dr. Chambers, thank you so much. Welcome to What's Working. Also with me is Andy Bird. Andy is a PhD, MBA, director of the University of South Alabama's Office of Commercialization and Industry Collaboration, where he is tasked to do four things. I'm only going to read two of them. Identify, assess, protect, and commercialize promising intellectual property emerging from University of South Alabama research and educate the university's faculty, staff, and students in technology transfer. That's all correct. correct? That's all correct. Yeah. Welcome, both of you. Thanks very much for coming to Works Working. I think you're by far the most degreed group of people I've had on the show thus far. <laughs> Maybe we should leave now. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe the introduction was the high point. Let's see. So I want to start with i core i core is featured on the website that I pursued or reviewed prior to getting you in here. Tell me what i core is and tell me what it means to the business community in Mobile. So i core is a program from the National Science Foundation. That's the group that doles out about $7 billion to academic institutions and grants every year, specifically uh, South Alabama, the University of South Alabama, received a grant. We get $100,000 per year that we can fund teams of scientists and students to go through an eight-week program that's kind of a fast commercialization course to teach them a little of the basics of business. Uh, during that eight weeks, they're trained by, we have roughly, Andrew, I think we have 12 different people on the teaching team mm -hmm. that go from uh, serial entrepreneurs to former Wall Street executives who are on the teaching team. And a critical part of the course is they get out of the classroom and they do 30 interviews in the private sector uh, during that eight weeks. The principle is to find out what the private sector really wants. So you might ask, why would the National Science Foundation be interested in that? Well, in the past, people were getting grants. They were doing the work, writing an article, maybe building a prototype. And then at the end of those two years, they were going to someone like an Airbus or whoever and said, look what I've done, do you like it? And they would say, it's interesting, but it's round, it needs to be square, it's blue, it needs to be green. And what this does is in that eight weeks, they find out what the people want in advance. And then for two years, they work on what people want, not on something that people will never buy or use. So that's i -Corps. So the i -Corps, and, and the motive is the National Science Foundation feels this contribution, this donation or this, this grant is worth it, why? I mean, why? Why is the, what is the gain to the National Science Foundation or the, or the, the nation who's funding this? 
Well, the primary point of the National Science Foundation is to promote basic research, and it does it by looking at two things, what we call intellectual merit and then broader impacts. What this program does is it tries to increase both of those, but primarily broader impacts. What was happening is the academic research was not being applied in the community. So if you've got a great invention of a medical nature and it never gets outside of the lab in, in by the bedside, from bench to bedside, for example, as we say, what good is the investment? So what the National Science Foundation is trying to do is bridge that gap. To take it into the commercial marketplace. Now, is there an angle that these people have to come in with? In other words, if I go to an Airbus and say, uh, what do you need? You got to narrow that conversation down a little bit to say, do you need something as a as a part or as a software device? I mean, how do you narrow down what it is that you're working with them on? I, uh, that's a great question. Why don't you probably have some ideas? Andy, huh? give us some feedback on that. Yeah. So um, it, the whole, the, like as Dr. Chambers said, the purpose of ICOR is to go out and um, target your. Uh, potential customer in the future for your technology. And one of the functions of i is to ask those exact questions. Typically, from, from my office's standpoint, you can imagine we receive a lot of invention disclosures that are at the idea stage. Yeah. They haven't been de-risked a whole lot to sufficiently attract industry attention as far as a collaboration or a license agreement with the university. And it plays well with the i program because for instance, if we have a university technology that a team, an i team wants to form around, it might be a platform technology, like a, a new carbon fiber reinforced composite material that might be used on a spaceship or it might be used in a golf club to reinforce the shaft. Well, we don't exactly know what that ideal product to enter the market might be for that technology, and the best person to tell us that is the people who are going to be buying it and using it. So what we go out and we do, we don't ask, hey, would you, would you buy this technology if it were available? We coach and mentor these teams to go out and identify their potential customer segment, identify the target customer within that customer segment, and go ask them, you know, what's your biggest pain point in, um, you know, your, in the automotive industry, for example? What's your biggest pain point in reducing weight of the frame of a BMW? And, and you tease those answers out of them, then you take that back and incorporate that into your decision-making process on the appropriate direction to move the technology forward. Who's coming to you? Tell me the customer, not the customer, the inventor, we'll call them the inventor, the business person, Who, uh, who's coming to you? What do they see in you? Is it an accelerated process that they're getting? Exactly, so you know, who are our customers in ICOR? Who comes and participates? We have students who may be business students, computing students, engineering students. They, our program offers a four-credit option through South. We also have a, kind of affiliations with the University of Mobile and Spring Hill College, as well as Bishop State. When we filed this grant, uh, I think one of the things I love about South is we try to be very collaborative, and so we reached out to those institutions, and we're happy to consider other institutions, too, who would like to participate to get their students involved. And so you may have a student who just wants to learn this. You may have, in South's context, like the inventor of this carbon fiber technology, a uh, professor who has a grad student who he would like to put on this technology and take it through this eight-week course and see what happens. In that particular case with the carbon fibers, not only did, uh, in, in that case, they actually uh, became a national team. So they left South and participated in a national team for another $50,000 grant. And you say, um, I'm trying to remember what you said, Andrew, but part of that process, which I was involved in, they thought that that technology would be great, say, in a BMW yeah. and, or a Tesla. And so they, they went to Tesla and they interviewed the vice president of product development for Tesla. And he said, you're wasting your time. Really? Yeah. And the reason was that if you look at the cost of the carbon fibers and what's required to do it, even though it has advantages, the alloys that they have now are just as light and offer some greater advantages, perhaps. And so that was significant. And that's a key part of the i program is because you learn up front that one of your fundamental assumptions going in was wrong. You could have spent two years developing that on the assumption that all the electric cars were going to want this. But we were told almost immediately to go somewhere else. And it's important. Does the project die or do you go find another market? 
Uh, well, no, hopefully the project does not die unless everyone says no. <laughs> but uh, i has been very beneficial where we use the term pivot. You take the customer feedback, you incorporate that into sort of your, your, your business thesis on what is your value proposition that you're proposing to solve a perceived need. You take that customer feedback, you modify, you might have to pivot uh, your customer segment. In this case, you might have to say, well, look, you know, an automotive incorporation of my technology might not be feasible at this time, but, you know, Taylor might need a new golf shaft made out of carbon fiber, or, you know, a, a skateboard company might want to look at the uh, carbon fiber for their durability of their skateboard. So you take that feedback and, and you don't, even though the, 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 Honestly, the point of i one of the major focus is to fail fast, right? You want to know before you go spend time and money if this thing has legs or not. Part of that is not necessarily a yes or no. Part of it can be a shift or a pivot to a different customer service or a different customer segment, or you could modify some features of your technology to better address the needs of the customer segment that you set out towards to start with. Well, I can see how a inventor, we'll call him inventor again, would be both excited about this, but at the same time, after thinking and thinking and thinking and then trying to implement this thing, having their legs swept out from under them, I guess a part of your work is motivation at the same time, isn't it? You can't lose faith. Well, I, I, let's pick that up when we come back. I want we got to go to break. Uh, you're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. Andrew Bird in the Office of Commercialization and Industry Collaboration are responsible for identifying, protecting, and commercializing intellectual property coming from South. And this is no small task. There's a lot of research emerging from South. How do you know what research is pertinent in today's world? And better yet, how do you protect it? Coastal Alabama Community College offers a class in the legal and social environment of business. Topics include trade regulation, contracts, and current business issues. If these issues sound interesting to you, check this out and other courses offered through the Associates of Science and Business Administration degree at Coastal Alabama Community College. To learn more, go to coastalalabama.edu. We'll be right back. The Community Foundation of South Alabama links donors to philanthropy, builds networks across eight counties, and builds dreams for those in need. Through our donors' gifts, we make investments that enhance our community via initiatives with broad impact. Working with you, we build communities. Contact us at communityfoundationsa.org. This is Coastal Alabama Community College, where education is key and where there is opportunity in every classroom. We serve nine counties with one common goal. Here, we come together to create a brighter future. Together, we inspire. Together, we learn. Together, we succeed. This is Coastal Alabama Community College. All together. I'm Matt Armbruster with Ransom Ministries. We help people in our community that most others have given up on. Please donate your unwanted electronics to Ransom Recycling. We teach life skills, job readiness, and job creation through our electronic recycling program. We take anything with a cord. Find us at RansomMinistries.com or you can call us at 251-751-0044. back. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is brought to you by Coastal Alabama Community College. I'm with Michael Chambers and Andy Bird, both from the University of South Alabama. Prior to break, we were talking about uh, your, I guess, do you feel like you have to motivate these people? Do you feel you have to continue to cheer for them if they've had their idea uh, defeated by, let's say, a Tesla or a BMW? Uh, We warn them. And it's probably a good data point to realize that when they first created this program, this class. It was based on, they went to a guy named Steve Blank, who was a serial entrepreneur and teaching at the Stanford Business School, and basically hired him to create this course. And they launched the pilot of that course with 21 teams. And at the end of the eight weeks, 18 of the 21 teams had either changed the product or decided that they were trying to sell to the wrong customer. And that's not a failure. 
that's really success because what it means is those people will be working on something now that people really want, not something they don't want. So we consider that a failure. We warn them at the beginning of the class that 85 to 90 percent of the teams will change either the product or the customer. So yes, if you're a professor and you have a baby and the baby is within this kind of tight box that you've labeled whatever, and then all of a sudden the box is completely different, that kind of shatters your world. But we try to warn them. And you've probably seen that too, Andrew. I, I have, I have. And, and that's a great question because, <clears throat> excuse me, oftentimes, um, and I can speak not from a student bringing a potential team into i but maybe a team wrapping itself around one of the USA technologies where we do have an inventor who most likely that technology that they've disclosed as an invention to the university that they want the i team to explore, that might be 20 years worth, the culmination of 20 years worth of research. You know, when you think of the life sciences, we're a very life sciences heavy research institution. Some of these are new drugs. Some of them are new diagnostics, software, serv- uh, software systems for uh, hospital settings. So a lot of times this can be 10, 15, 20 years worth of work, and then you have an inventor who's told, I'm sorry, that's just not that important in the marketplace, or it might be applicable somewhere else. And so there is. We have a really great, uh, Dr. Chambers has put together an excellent mentor uh, teaching team as mentors, and we work together. We work with the inventors. We work with the entrepreneurial lead. We work with the students. But as Dr. Chambers said, they are warned that this is not a program for thin skin. You have yeah. to have thick skin for it. You really do. You mentioned mentors. Tell me about RAMP, R-A-M-P, and its origination out of MIT. Sh- sure. So RAMP st- is kind of our local product for a team-based mentoring program for young companies. So it stands for Real Advice Mentoring Program. I guess it originated when we did the Leaders Exchange through the chamber with uh, Greenville many years ago, and we came across this program they told us about, team-based mentoring. They had gone to MIT, received training, and paid for a license fee from MIT. MIT's program comprises like 180 business mentors and a gazillion different young companies because it's Boston MIT. Long story short, we South went to the county commission, and I think we started with Commissioner Ludgood, then we talked to the mayor's office, uh, basically to get a basket of money to license this program. We did. It's a collaboration between South, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the city, the county, uh, the Small Business Development Council here, center, um, through Mel Washington. And am I leaving anybody out, Andrew, in that collaboration? I believe so. Um, And the Innovation Portal, if I didn't mention the Innovation Portal, all came together to get the training. And so we are now have done the pilot. We have 16 young companies and 28 mentors. The mentors are put together in teams based on expertise and the needs of these young companies. So we just finished our pilot and reviewing the data, and there's like an 85 percent satisfaction um, result from the mentors and the companies. So what we see, and I I represent a considerable amount of scar tissue in my career of, uh, you know, chasing the wrong rabbit. What we try to do with these experienced teams is offer expertise to companies that can't really afford it uh, because they're early stage. So we calculate that the value of this mentoring is maybe $10,000 to $12,000 a year, which is provided right now uh, absolutely free. And I would say that we just recently received a sponsorship from BBVA, which we're very uh, excited about and hope to expand. But that, in large part, is the program. How does one apply to become mentored? So we have an online application that you can just uh, fill out. And when we started with our pilot, we were kind of surgical in picking the teams. And we just added teams a couple of months ago and restarted, rebooted in uh, August. But if any company is interested in the mentoring program, we don't take concepts really or just ideas. Uh, We prefer that you have some revenue, that you're actually a company that we can help direct. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we have... Just a a very interesting set of companies that cover the gamut from welding academies uh, to uh, uh, Nanny Connie, if you're familiar with Nanny Connie, uh, the uh, uh, Nanny to the Stars. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, So we have a a great variety of companies to uh, Fishing Chaos that kind of started as a 
tournament software tournament platform for fishing that's expanded into other areas. So it's, it's very exciting. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. I'm here with Michael Chambers and Andy Bird, both of the University of South Alabama. Tell me some of the inventions that you've seen coming through i Tell me some success stories and maybe even tell me some failures. Yeah, so I can speak with uh, to some of the technologies that the teams have uh, run through the i program that are university affiliated. So we came up with a with a concept of having what we call an MVP candidate. It's a minimum viable product candidate. So we, uh, oftentimes we'll have some teams, they'll come in and they'll say, this sounds interesting, this sounds great, this is a process I want to go through as a learning tool. I don't have a business idea. I don't have a technology. And so we recognize that need, Dr. Chambers and, and I and the team. And I went back into the university's portfolio of technologies that seem to have the potential for, uh, you know, a team could, could, could feasibly make a product out of this and enter the market without things like FDA regulatory approval and clinical trials and, and FAA uh, you know, uh, regulatory issues. So we have a list, it's a short list, 10 or 12 technologies, and one um, example would be a nursing dashboard that was designed by one of our nurses uh, that worked for the USA Health, and it's designed to, it's kind of like you've heard of personalized medicine, that's a, that's a common uh, buzzword now. Well, this is more of personalized workforce management, workload management for nurses. A nurse recognized the need on the floor to try to identify when an individual nurse is reaching a workload level that makes them more likely to have a, a, a near miss or an error or uh, any, anything in, in that regard. And as you can imagine, different patients have a different time demand on the nurse. And so she said, hey, we need a software that can learn uh, what those threshold limits are on an individualized, personalized basis. And so we thought this was going to be a standalone, nice little um, uh, medical software app. Through i we realized that... Um, uh, well, the feedback that we got from from the from the team, and they actually went to a medical managers conference in New Orleans, which is provided for through the i program as well, and interviewed a, a lot of potential users and discovered that they're probably it was not as robust of a value proposition to be a standalone software, but it might could be bolted on to other existing systems. So, yes, that was a failure in that our business thesis may have been a little bit off. Um, but it was a success in that now we know now we have a bit better idea of where we need to where's the entry point in the market for that product, and the team uh, might actually be going and participating in the national program just like the carbon fiber team that we had mentioned. So the ideas they come to you. This was a group that did not have a business in mind, but wanted to sink their teeth into what you offered, and mm-hmm. you supplied them with a business to explore, and exchanged for that they got a credits, uh, information, mm-hmm. I share a these lot were two of introductions. Student, yeah, these were two students who were uh, masters in the master's program at, at the College of Business, and they, one was from the medical field and one was from statistics, but had a statistics background, and they they didn't even, they, they had just met prior to the semester and said, hey, we this i program sounds interesting, so they came in and just said, we want to do it, and they identified that technology because it was sort of data analytics, healthcare, it was in their background and they took it and ran with it. What if someone had bought it? What if this thing had been an explosive success? Uh, How does any sort of revenue generated from this product get distributed? So that's a great question. In in this specific situation, since it is a university-owned piece of intellectual property, that would have been through a licensing deal. Uh, You know, we have uh, multiple ways of licensing technologies, and this would have been a software that would have been licensed, or maybe we could partner up with a larger electronic health records company, and they could add it as a a bolt-on product feature to their software system. And then off a percentage of those sales, you know, it's a typical licensing arrangement would be, you know, some upfront money to the university for for the technology and then a royalty uh, as the, as they as they generate revenue that's enabled by the technology. Is the university currently getting revenues from current products in action out there today? We are. We are. We've we've actually had some some really nice uh, successes if over the past 10 or 12 years. We we brought in about 1.8 to 2.2 million a year in royalties. Yeah. Um, we were actually featured back in 2000 and I think it was 10 
2000 and around 2008, 2010 in Forbes as one of the top 15 universities in the nation for patent generating revenue. So they look at research expenditures, how much money the university is bringing in to do research, to do research in relation to how much money they're bringing in off of royalties, which is a metric for commercializing university, intellectual property that come out of, comes out of university research. And so um, we were basically being in the top 15, it meant we were efficient in using our research dollars to generate societal benefit as measured by royalties coming into the university. Is there a product out there right now that I interact with or any of these listeners interact with that may be related to South Alabama or any one of these similar uh, operations across the country? Absolutely. Um, but one of the success stories is uh, vitamin B. Really? Um, yes, yes, vitamin B. Back when the uh, you know supplements, vitamin whole food supplements were were growing in their market attention uh, 20 years ago, 20 year, 25 years ago. We had two re researchers at the College of Medicine, Dr. Uh, Steve Bailey and June Ailing. They came up with a formulation to present uh, a, a vitamin three folate in its natural form to the body. Dramatically increased the bioavailability and how, the, how much of the body, how much of the vitamin the body would take in, process, use, and so all the efficiency numbers were, were up for that type of formulation. And that ended up in a licensing deal with a large company and it, it brought in a lot of money. So if you weren't, you know, now it's, uh, you know, prenatal supplements, folic acid, that's a folate, uh, a synthesized folate form. And there's, there's different products that if it's vitamin B, somewhere back 20, 25 years ago, there was probably June Ailing and Steve Bailey's technology incorporated into providing that in the whole food format to the human body. Dr. Chambers, what's the most satisfying part of your work? Well, I would say if you look back five or six years ago in terms of what we offered from an entrepreneurial point of view to people in Mobile or students at South or students at other institutions, there weren't a lot of programs. Uh, and what I think the most satisfying thing for me is to look and due to the leadership of a lot of people at South in the community, we have a lot more programs now that help people who want to start a business, who don't want to make critical mistakes early. And I'd say seeing that evolve, seeing it grow in Mobile, is probably one of the most satisfying things for me. And I want to talk about the future of entrepreneurial growth in Mobile, in the Deep South, and get your feedback on whether we're poised for something big or not, what you see out there. And we'll get into that when we get back from this break. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. Think about your home. What do you see? Do you just see two stories or the stories of your toddler's first steps? <laughs> now think about your car. Do you see an odometer reading or your kids reading in the back seat? Other insurance companies just see a house. They just see a car. But a State Farm agent sees what your home and your car really mean to you. So why not give them the protection they deserve? You can reach me, State Farm agent Allison Horner, at allisonhorner.com. Investing, connecting, leading, providing. The Community Foundation of South Alabama brings together philanthropic assets to make Southwest Alabama a better place to live, work, and play. We link donors to philanthropy. Working with you, we build communities. Contact us at communityfoundationsa.org. I'm Matt Armbruster with Ransom Ministries. We help people in our community that most others have given up on. Please donate your unwanted electronics to Ransom Recycling. We teach life skills, job readiness, and job creation through our electronic recycling program. We take anything with a cord. Find us at RansomMinistries.com or you can call us at 251-751-0044. Listening to What's Working, I'm Cam Marston. I'm sitting here with Dr. Andy Bird and Dr. Michael Chambers, both from the University of South Alabama. Uh, the future of entrepreneurship in this part of the country. So when you say to me entrepreneurship, the first thing that comes to mind is some genius in his garage in Silicon Valley. That's where these ideas, or at least that's the, 
the theme of the day or up in uh, uh, Seattle or something like that. That's obviously not true. There's entrepreneurship happening everywhere. What's seeding it? What's growing it in our part of the country? Somebody out there right now is listening and has had an idea for a business or a product. Encourage them. Let me hear, hear what the encouragement would be based on what you see in our marketplace today. Well, what I see is a wealth of tools, a wealth of groups that are willing to help that didn't exist five or six years ago. Uh, programs like RAMP, uh, the Innovation Portal, some of the other elements and features of the ecosystem that are here in Mobile, RAMP, the Minority Business Acceleration Program, uh, none of those existed five or six years ago. And it was really due to really great leadership with the city and the county and people like Lynn Cronister at South Alabama that put a lot of these programs together to the forefront to try to make a difference. So I would tell those people that it's not as risky as it used to be. It still most of the time requires a leap of faith um, to jump kind of whole hog into a, a project. And not all of them succeed. But the people who do it, who are willing to take advice and make that leap and succeed, are probably some of the happiest and most satisfied people that you'll ever meet. Well, that was my next question. What are these entrepreneurs who are willing to make themselves vulnerable, quite frankly, both financially and emotionally, what do they have in common? What is the common element? If you could line up all these people, uh, their interests and their backgrounds and their hobbies and their inventions are going to be radically different from one another. But there's got to be a common thread. What is that common thread of the entrepreneur from this part of the country? Um, I, I, I firmly believe it is a mindset and a heart um, that not everyone has. Uh, we and, and I'll I'll take a couple of steps back. You know, when we receive an invention disclosure, um, you know, not all inventors are entrepreneurs. There are plenty of inventors who come up with a great idea, they submit it, and they say, "I've got other things that I'm moving on with. I don't want to do any. I don't want to do anything with business. I don't want to be a business person." And you can imagine we see that a lot in academia. People like their academic professor position. Um, so when we have entrepreneurs who uh, maybe a, a common thread is. You almost can't tell them no sometimes. <laughs> it doesn't matter the, 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 the complicated nature of the technology. It could be an app for a phone or it could be a new drug um, that, that has a 15-year you know, timeline to market. You still have to have that personality that says you, know, you, 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 you got to drive forward. You got to be dedicated. You have, to, uh, you have to have some interpersonal skills. I mean, just because you're a genius in a technology does not mean you're a genius, genius in social settings. Not everyone who has a high IQ has a high EQ, right? And so, so I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs that I see make it, whether it's going to your mom and dad and asking for your initial loan, right, or going to the bank and convincing a banker to give you a loan when you don't have any credit, um, or it's going to angel investors or VCs. You, you have to have a drive, and you have to have uh, some interpersonal skills, and that those aren't always there with everyone. And a lot of what the ecosystem that Michael had mentioned, just like it, an invention, we try to de-risk the technology. I think our local, I don't think, I know, our, our local eco ecosystem um, uh, has really come together, multiple parties, the chamber, the city, the universities, um, to, to, to build an, in, an ecosystem that helps de-risk the likelihood of failure, in my opinion, of these startup companies. So like Michael said, it's, it's, not, it's not that hard anymore. And I think that can be attributed to the concerted effort to develop an ecosystem like open workspaces, like mentorship programs. I came through 1702 in the inaugural class. There's these pieces in place. We can't say, here, here's the, here's the magic formula to success. But we can say there's things that people who've bumped our, or stubbed our toes and bruised our knees before, we can tell you these things that you could do to increase the likelihood of your success. And I think you know, people who might be sitting out there, find an ecosystem. Don't try to do it on your own. Don't try to do it out of your garage sometimes, right. honestly. Um, but, you know, find an ecosystem that you can plug into. And th there are ones that you can plug into that are a great resource. There are ones that you can plug into that they want equity out of your company in order to help mentor your company. So you, can, you sort of need to shop around. And we have a, we have a great system here so far. Um, that we would love love to help with with entrepreneurs, any future entrepreneurs. But 
stay dedicated, stay motivated, develop your interpersonal skills and find an ecosystem to plug into because those are there to de-risk your you know, chances of so, failure. So all those bad qualities you listed, and you're looking at me every time. You mention <laughs> <laughs> so, Only in the stub toes and the bruised knees <laughs> <to> comment. <laughs> so l- imagine that I've come to you, and I've got an idea for a product or a service, and I, you know, I'm sold on it, as most people I'm sure that get your attention are. They're sold on it. Give me a sample of three or four questions oh. you're going to answer. <laughs> ask this entrepreneur to get a sense of how viable the product may be and how much they've thought about it? Well, that's a great question because really one of the first things we do with an i for example, is what we call a business thesis, but it's really the answer to three simple questions. What's the product? Who's the customer? Why will they buy it? A lot of people have ideas about a product, but when you tar- start talking to them about, okay, who's the customer? It's like, well, I'm, I'm not really sure. Why will they buy it? Well, it depends on who the customer is, and I'm not really sure. That's the heart of the program is not being so attached to your initial conception of what the product is that you're willing to change the product uh, or you're willing to sell it to a different customer or understand that maybe there are four different customers and four different variations of the product, and each sliver of that is a different market size with different distribution channels. And it's that appreciation of the complexity But we start with those simple questions because that really helps people understand the complexity sometimes of what we were dealing with. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. And as I like to say, who cares? Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of times we get inventions. uh, And the first question I ask, once I understand the technical nature of the invention, my next question oftentimes to the inventor is who cares about this? I mean, is, is this great science? that we should just put out into the public domain and dedicate it to public benefit? Or is this something that has commercial potential that we need to look at uh, some intellectual property protection strategies? And that just gets to the heart at the, at the business thesis question that we, that we run through i is is um, who cares and what do they care about on this technology? When you, when you have a drug that's a, that's a cancer therapeutic, it's a little more obvious. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but but there, are, there are a lot of gray areas in tech transfer, which is the traditional name for what I do, technology transfer. Um, that I think every case is so unique in, in, in my in, in what I do and what we look at for the university because you I mean, you can imagine we have everything from you know engineering software civil engineering basic hardcore chemistry medical application diagnostics and so it runs the gamut and each one needs their own due diligence but the first question is. Who's going to buy it? What is it and who's going to buy it and why do they care? So there's another, people tend to say early, well, they're going to buy it because it's cheaper. We have this premise, it's called, it's not ours, but it's called the five whys. Like, and why is it cheaper? And people will pause for a second and try to think about that. Well, because uh, we're going to get, use cheaper materials, you know, or and we just keep asking why. Why, why are you going to use that material? Why? Uh, and you, you rapidly see that people haven't really thought through right. all of these things. When they do these interviews in the private sector, all those answers are more available to them, and it helps them pivot. It yeah. helps them choose. So do you see people wither? I can just see someone who's married to their idea, who absolutely loves this brainchild of their own, wither under this intense criticism. And it's not criticism. You're, you're actually helping them prevent failure, and that's I understand what you're doing. But you must see some disheartened expressions from people as they realize their idea isn't perhaps as good as they thought it was, or it's, you, their original intention for the idea maybe not be it's not as good. Well, I, I think anytime you deal, with, like I deal with mostly, is, is are scientists um, and researchers and MDs, PhDs, ninety percent of the time. And w- what you don't want to do is, you know, just take a challenge head on and say, look, your idea isn't worth anything. I mean, it's 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 really it's it's a very fun job interacting with our with our faculty researchers. So you can take what they give you, do your own research, form your own opinion, and then you sit down with them and say, "Hey, look, this is what I found out about this technology." There's there's 180 patents in the intellectual property landscape at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office only. There's three other competing products out here that are not exactly what you've invented, but are pretty pretty darn close. Yeah. And, um, and and we just sit down and ha- it's an opportunity to educate. It, it's still to this day, I've been doing this for almost seven years, and it's still surprising that uh, the amount of, uh, of researchers that we get that really just 
for whatever reason, they don't know what tech transfer process is. What's the process from a lot of researchers see when they hand us an invention disclosure, that's the finish line when actually it's more of a, a starting point. Yeah. And so it's, it's an opportunity to educate and a lot of researchers are open to it. What they would, what would bother them the most is for us to say, yes, this is good, file a patent on it and set it on the shelf and let it wither there. Cause that's false expectations. Tell me about some of the inventions that you have available. You talked about the um, dashboard for the nursing school, or not the nursing school, the nursing uh, dashboard. Tell me what, el what else is in there that may be of interest to somebody listening. Yeah, so earlier we mentioned the uh, we have a, a few novel manufacturing methods for putting uh, carbon fiber uh, reinforcement in composite materials. And that's a big, big, big topic right now for the carbon fiber industry across multiple industry segments um, that technology we have some 3d print technology we have you can imagine we're, we are life sciences heavy so we have some some research tools and research reagents that are non-human use that can be used in the lab that we're commercializing on a non-exclusive basis sort of like catalog you put them out there in catalogs um, and then we have uh, some metabolic related therapeutics like for mitochondrial dna repair or vitamin b type uh, supplements as you can imagine, we have some uh, biomarker cases that will help partition patient populations based on the expected, their expected response to a certain type of therapeutic, mm -hmm. like so, sort of like a, a, a bifurcation of your patient population. If you have this genetic marker, triage. then we'll, yeah, we'll, triage, we'll, we'll triage step one and we'll go to step two. Um, technologies like that. We have some that aren't quite as complicated. We have some technologies that are related to facial recognition software. We have some technologies uh, that are related to, like, the, the nursing dashboard. We have an interesting technology that a College of Medicine and Engineering collaborated on where you take extract from aspen tree bark, and you can use that to synthesize silver nanoparticles that, are, have, that exhibit some ultraviolet B radiation protection. So we're looking at it as maybe a sunscreen booster, an additive to boost sunscreens. So Good gracious. It, yeah. If you look like me, that's important. <laughs> <laughs> you could always go stand under the aspen tree, or you could wrap yourself in the bark. That's a, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So we've got a minute left. If someone's listening and is interested in i if someone has an idea or an invention that's on their own personal shelf, how do they find you? Well, they can go to uh, just Google uh, i at USA, and they'll go right to the website, and that will leak back to me ultimately. And you're their first point of contact, huh? Uh, I'll be their first point of contact. Yeah. 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 For i -Corps. And we, we probably almost once a month, once every other month, we'll have uh, someone local who may, they may have gone to invent help and filed a patent. And then now they want to know, okay, now what is this worth? And so they'll come sit down with us. They just, they reach out to my office as part of the service arm of the university, service to the community. We sit down with local inventors uh, quite regularly and discuss, I mean, even students, because, you know, students aren't employees of the university. We sit down with them, discuss their idea with them, and give them a little education on how to move forward or what we might do if it were ours. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'm glad to know you're out there. If someone's got an invention, someone's got an idea, if someone has a business idea to pursue, they don't need to leave this neck of the woods to pursue it anymore. Or I don't know that they ever did, but I, we can emphasize that clearly today. You can pursue that as thoroughly as you want right here. Clearly today, and my office can help facilitate. If it's not something that the university has ownership rights in, we could introduce to outside you know, patent attorneys as needed. Yeah, We have a ton of people here in Mobile that are willing to help. Yes, Excellent. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. We'll be back after these breaks. Thank you both very much for your time. <laughs> A good bit of research emerging from South is in the medical fields. Thank goodness. Let's find some cures. If you're interested in pursuing a degree in a medical field, Coastal Alabama Community College offers Associates of Science degrees in biological and biomedical sciences. If you'd like to pursue a bachelor's degree, Coastal Alabama has transfer agreements with all public and most private four-year universities in Alabama. The friendly staff at Coastal Alabama will help guide you in the right direction and ensure you have a smooth transfer. For more information, check out coastalalabama.edu or visit any one of their campuses. Is your business growing? Does your existing metal building need an update? Expansion? New roof? With almost 20 years of experience, Mosley Building Systems is the leading metal building contractor along the Gulf Coast. We are your local design build experts. 
From expansion to new construction or repairs, we can guide you through all aspects of your project. Mosley Building Systems works with each client to fulfill their vision. For more information, go to MosleyBuildingSystems.com. Coastal Alabama Community College is three amazing colleges combined into one incredible institution. And that means we're all together. For more sports, 15 more locations, more friends, more one-on-one -on -one time with instructors, way more activities, more courses, a lot more courses, and more success for all of us. Pretty much more of everything. Coastal Alabama Community College is where everyone is. All together! Coastal Alabama Community College. Register today. Investing, connecting, leading, providing. The Community Foundation of South Alabama brings together philanthropic assets to make Southwest Alabama a better place to live, work, and play. We link donors to philanthropy. Working with you, we build communities. Contact us at communityfoundationsa.org. I'm Kim Marston. This is What's Working, brought to you by Coastal Alabama Community College. I want to thank Doctors Chamber and Doctors Bird for their time talking about uh, getting these products and ideas into place. I can see that there's an extraordinary amount of wisdom in their department and the time that they spend with the different people, as well as access. And I think there's great value to this. The older I'm getting, the more I'm realizing that we each hold value in our network, who we know and who we can call that will take our call and offer us some help, even to introduce a third party. Hey, I need you to meet with somebody, buddy or something uh, that's got an idea. Would you spend time with them? Our networks become more valuable, and Doctors Chamber and Bird both have access to extraordinary networks of business minds, entrepreneurs, inventors in our area. And even after we ended our conversation, I told them about an idea that I had had that I'm kind of working on, and in a very brief amount of time, they asked me a handful of questions that revealed insights about this business idea that I had not yet considered. In a short amount of time, in an informal environment, unstructured without me preparing them or being prepared to talk about this, their insights quickly opened up some ideas about a product idea that I had and could tell what they offer is something really very valuable. So I'm grateful for that. One of the things that I'm trying to continue to do that I have fallen off of is to make sure you all know how to get in touch with us. If you have guest ideas, if you have feedback for a guest, if you have questions that you'd like to give to a guest, if you just like to leave a message, let me tell you how to do it. First is the phone slash text line. That number is 251-260-8100. Like I said, phone slash text. It's not a uh, manned line. You'll leave a message and you can text that number too. The website, Cam marston.com go to cammarston.com across the top of the page you'll find my podcast link where each one of these shows is converted into a podcast where you can download it listen to it again or just as importantly send it to somebody who you feel needs to hear it my email cam c-a-m at cammarston.com these are the ways to get to the show. These are the ways to listen to us, get us messages. We got a lot of great guests coming up. It's amazing how the momentum of this show now, we're about 18 months in, has built and continues to build and the listener base is growing and more and more of our guests are aware of the show and are very happy to accommodate us into their schedule when we ask if they want to be on it. We got some national, quite a few local and very excited with the direction this, that this show continues to take. As we close down, I want to thank the people that make this happen. happen. Kristen Ogden coordinates the schedules and does a remarkable job with a bunch of busy people. And the show's producer is John Thompson at Ion Digital. We wouldn't be able to get the quality of sound we do without John. We'll have another show for you next week, everybody. Have a great week. Music.